Hello everyone and thanks for joining us on Diplomatic Channel. I'm Teniola Shobowale, standing in for your regular host, Amarachi Ubani. Diplomatic Channel this week takes a look at the Ukraine conflict amid fears of Russian invasion and how far allies are willing to go to protect Kyiv. Later, we speak to the United Nations Development Programme's Regional Director for Africa, Ahuna Iziakunwa, on Africa's economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. But first, let's begin the program by taking a quick check on discussions in diplomatic circles. Naftali Bennett has become the first Israeli leader to visit the United Arab Emirates as he attempts to deepen ties at a time of rising tensions over Iran. Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the UAE's de facto leader, held talks with Mr. Bennett a year after their countries normalized relations. Shared concern about Iranian activity was among reasons for the formalization of Israel-UAE relations last year under a U.S.-led regional initiative known as the Abraham Accords. Australia has signed a $717 million defense deal with South Korea, boosting Seoul's efforts to grow its military exports. While the defense deal is the headline of South Korean President Moon Jae-in's four-day trip to Australia, both countries say they have also agreed to work closely to help ensure supplies of Australian critical mineral exports for South Korea's tech sector. That concludes the ceremony. Thank you. An Air China plane carrying COVID-19 vaccines donated by China arrives in Nicaragua days after the two countries announced the resumption of their diplomatic relations. The plane transported 200,000 doses of vaccines produced by Chinese medical giant Sinopharm. The donation came days after the Central American country announced re-establishing diplomatic relations with China and severing ties with the island of Taiwan. We are very happy. This is like a big Christmas gift for Nicaraguan people. France and the Netherlands officials say they are seeking to find the common European Union approach over a diplomatic boycott of the 2022 Olympic Games in China, but any decision is unlikely to be reached soon. The bloc is torn over whether to join the United States, Canada, Australia and Britain in deciding not to send their government officials to the Beijing Winter Games in February due to concerns over China's human rights record. It was only seven years ago that Russia seized part of southern Ukraine and backed separatists who started a conflict in large areas of the east. Now there are affairs in Ukraine and among Western leaders that Russian forces are getting ready for another invasion. According to U.S. intelligence reports, Russia already has over 100,000 troops positioned close to the Ukraine border. But Russia says it has no plans to invade. A buildup of Russian troops on the Ukrainian border has Kiev, NATO and its allies concerned that Moscow is about to invade again. Western leaders are trying to forestall that scenario. Most recently, a two-hour video call between U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Good to see you again. According to the White House, during the call, President Biden told Putin the U.S. and allies would respond with strong economic and other measures if Russia pursued military escalation and calls for a return to diplomacy. President Biden was direct and straightforward with President Putin, as he always is. He reiterated America's support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. He told President Putin directly that if Russia further invades Ukraine, the United States and our European allies would respond with strong economic measures. 
we would provide additional defensive materiel to the Ukrainians above and beyond that which we are already providing. And we would fortify our NATO allies on the eastern flank with additional capabilities in response to such an escalation. He also told President Putin there's another option, de-escalation and diplomacy. The United States and our European allies would engage in a discussion that covers larger strategic issues, including our strategic concerns with Russia and Russia's strategic concerns. The Kremlin said that Putin insisted that Ukraine joining the NATO military alliance would cross a red line for Russia, and he demanded guarantees from President Biden that NATO will not expand further eastward, including by giving Ukraine membership. A key topic for Ukraine has been gaining admission to NATO, which would give it stronger military alliances with the other member countries. Reacting to the talks, Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, said that while the meeting brought nothing spectacular, he was grateful for President Biden's unwavering support. Over the weekend, G7 foreign ministers also gathered in Liverpool and the United Kingdom to present a united front over the crisis with each of them reiterating threats of severe sanctions if the Kremlin moves forward with an invasion. Well, what we have to do is deter Russia from taking that course of action. I've been very clear it would be a strategic mistake for Russia to do that. And what the G7 meeting this weekend that's taking place is about is about a show of unity between like-minded major economies that we are going to absolutely be strong in our stance against aggression, against aggression with respect to Ukraine. Uh, there will be severe consequences if anything were to happen, but also make sure that we're building security and economic relationships with like-minded partners, including Ukraine, to protect them in the future. There are also talks of cutting Russia off the SWIFT payment system, sanctioning the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and strengthening NATO's eastern flank to deter Moscow. First, uh, we need to prepare a very strong political and economic sanctions package. I would not exclude things like sanctioning Nord Stream 2, disconnecting from SWIFT. And I think that Russia needs to know in advance what is the economic price tag. Political price tag, of course, it's again about uh, all the international organizations uh, being used just to uh, keep pressure. Uh, but we know that uh, political pressure is not enough. Second, I do believe that in that case, uh, NATO needs to increase its presence in what we call Eastern flank. Uh, just to show Russia that the price for doing some military adventure in Ukraine is more troops, more defense capability, and I underline defense capability in the Baltic states, in Poland, in Romania, in Bulgaria, those NATO countries that are actually directly affected by such kind of adventure. U.S. intelligence sources warned that the Kremlin is preparing for a multi-front offensive involving some 100,000 troops. We don't believe that Putin, we don't know that Putin has made up his mind to use force, but what we do know is that he's putting the Russian military, the Russian security services in a place where they could act in a pretty sweeping way. But, you know, Ukraine is an issue that he's made no secret in public over the course of recent years of the significance that he and much of the Russian elite attach uh, to their view um, that they ought to have significant influence over Ukraine's choices. Our view as a policy matter is obviously to, you know, um, continue unwavering support for Ukraine's territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence. But I would never underestimate President Putin's risk appetite on Ukraine. A large part of the recent Russian military buildup is in Crimea, a Black Sea peninsula with Russia seized from Ukraine and then annexed in 2014. 
Troops are also gathering near Donbas, and more than 14,000 people have lost their lives in seven years of conflict since Russian-backed forces seized large areas of Ukraine's east. Dr. Dapo Thomas, a foreign policy expert and senior lecturer in the Department of History and International Relations at the Lagos State University, joins us now for more on this. Dr. Dapo, thank you so much for your time on Diplomatic Channel. In terms of what Russia actually wants, though, some have said this isn't Russia's opposition to Ukraine wanting NATO membership or threats from Ukraine, like Moscow has alleged, but really, Vladimir Putin is using the threat of an invasion of an invasion to win concessions from the West. What are your thoughts? What concessions? What concessions? It's not. It's not. Uh, I do not think that that is diplomatically correct. What concessions do you want to win? I mean, what concessions do you want to? get from a nation like the United States when you are issuing threats. You do not get concessions under that, that kind of situation. The U.S. is not a nation that you can bully. It's not a nation that you can draw concessions uh, if you issue threats. So if you issue threats, they give you, I mean, they, they, they issue their own threats. And this is exactly what should have happened. This is exactly what should be expected. And I'm so sure that uh, uh, Putin is more experienced to expect that his threat would allow or make U.S. to make some concessions, you know. So they are they are also working on certain economic sanctions. They are not even working on any concessions. They are working on sanctions. So it, it will be diplomatic and it will be tactically erroneous for somebody like Putin, or for, I mean, a, a man with that kind of experience and everything, to say that he wanted concessions, and that's why he's using Ukraine as a bit. No, it's not, it doesn't work that way. The US is not a nation that you can police, it's not a nation you can threaten. And it's very dangerous for him, because there is a saying in international uh, relations that if you issue any threat and you fail to carry such threats out, then um, you lose your credibility as a superpower. So if you if he issues any threat, and that's why I believe that he cannot issue any threat, he, that's why he's going for denial. You know, that's why he's going for denial because it is very very. I mean, it is diplomatically correct for him to deny than to accept and then to issue threats. You don't issue a threat. You don't issue threat to a superpower like this. It's not. It's not done. But if come 2022, like intelligence officials are predicting, and Russia does invade Ukraine. What implications does this have for the wider region? Mm, it depends on the outcome of the war. It depends on the outcome of the war. If the war is in favor of Russia, obviously there will be some uh, reconfiguration within the region. And it's very likely. So if, if the war is, uh, I mean, if, if Russia comes victorious, if the outcome favors Russia, then that means that's the end of Ukraine as an independent nation, because the first thing that uh, Putin will do is to re-annex or is to bring back Ukraine into uh, Russia, into part of the Soviet Union or Russia now as it is. Uh, but I, I, I don't think that is a possibility. But even if it happens, then there will be a reconfiguration of international politics at Euro-Asia level, at even at the global level. Because you, when you say that uh, a war happens and then the United Nations, I mean the United States, loses the war, then it means the implication is that uh, Russia has emerged as the dominant power as a sole superpower and then there will be a reconfiguration of international politics because most of the allies of the united states haven't seen that the uh, united states has fallen you know or haven't seen that the united states have been defeated we would have to uh, reject they would have to reject the kind of alignment the kind of dynamics i mean there is all going to be some kind of uh, new dynamics new power dynamics within the international political arena and as such uh, uh, those are the implications. When Diplomatic Channels returns in just a moment, we speak to the UNDP's Regional Director for Africa on Africa's economic recovery in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks for staying with us. 
In order to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, Africa can no longer do business as usual. That's according to the United Nations Development Programme's Regional Director for Africa, Hauna Iziankoa. She made the comments in an interview with our foreign affairs correspondent, Amarachi Ubani, after the African Economic Conference, which held earlier this month. She says the pandemic has laid bare the changes that Africa needs to make to accelerate its economic development. Let's take a listen. Ms. Ahuna, thank you for speaking with me. And congratulations on the successful completion of the Africa Economic Conference. Thank you. I think it's the work of many hands here. We're very proud that we were able to have the conference here and uh, to conclude it successfully this evening. What was inspiring for you um, this past three days that um, delegates and participants have been discussing Africa's economy? Oh my God, it is, I think this feeling that um, Africa uh, has an opportunity now to relaunch itself uh, because COVID-19 has had such a fundamental impact on uh, the economies of the continent. But it's also laid bare where we need to make uh, a change. So there's, you know, throughout the, the, the conference, um, in the thinking and in the talking, um, there was a clear understanding that Africa cannot continue to do business as usual and that we need to take the opportunity of the crisis to actually reshape the economic structure of the continent. Speaking of development, uh, many African economies took a big hit from the COVID-19 pandemic pandemic is still with us. So do you think that, uh, what practical steps do you think that can be taken to help improve economies? I think there are three things that Africa needs um, to really invest in. One is capital, um, two is confidence, and three is competence. Um, first, I think this idea that we uh, need to stop the continent from, from bleeding it out its capital. There's a lot of capital flight. Uh, and at this conference, we established, for instance, one source of flight is the illicit financial flows, where we see close to $90 billion um, leave the continent every year in illicit flows. Um, this, you know, this is not sustainable. It's the same amount of money that can actually service all of Africa's debt. Um, so really the need to look at sources of capital for the continent to finance its development, both from within and also externally. I think the second thing that we really registered is that it's difficult for this continent to uh, develop without a, a greater sense of confidence in its own ability to take control of its destiny. There is no continent that we've seen, no region that developed without this inner confidence, which Africa somewhat lacks, you know, because of this legacy of slavery and colonization, which has left uh, kind of a, a dominance of, um, of um, inferiority complex, where everything that comes from outside is better than what is on the inside. And competence, I think, um, competence in terms of Africa's institutions, Africa's human resource, uh, human capital, we need to improve our vigilance on how the system, the international financial system works and how Africa public administration works and the competence of delivering um, to Africa's people in an accountable and, trans and transparent way. It almost sounds like the onus is now on the private sector to help push economies you know, into uh, progression. It is a responsibility for the private sector, but the public sector needs to enable the private sector, it needs to provide the conditions. And I think we also registered this in the discussions here. There are things that the public sector will need to do to catalyze uh, that environment for growth. Uh, they need to make sure that the regulatory environment is conducive for doing business. And in many African countries today, unfortunately, it isn't. The conditions are just not right for business to establish and to grow. So a lot of work both for public sector as well as uh, for private sector, embracing 
uh, business as part of the solution is, is one. Um, I think it's been important to, uh, to communicate to the world that Africa needs support and that we need this solidarity at a time of crisis that Africa did not cause um, to really uh, help Africa recover at the same pace as the rest of the world. And there's been some measures taken by international financial institutions to ease the fiscal pain for African countries, but these are short, very short-term measures, and yet the, the road to recovery is a long one. So we are uh, saying that um, more measures have to be put in place uh, and lending uh, conditions have to be eased for, for the continent. Uh, the debt crisis is making a comeback. Africa borrows at, a, at the highest interest rate compared to the rest of the world because it suffers this sort of pandemic of, uh, of, of a negative uh, rating um, because of the perceptions of Africa as, as high risk, which isn't always true, and nor is it fair. Uh, so there is a lot of work to do there also on the Africa side to really change the narrative and bring evidence and facts to bear on the rating agencies which consistently uh, rate uh, Africa unfavorably. Um, I think it's been important to, uh, to communicate to the world that Africa needs support and that we need this solidarity at a time of crisis that Africa did not cause um, to really uh, help Africa recover at the same pace as the rest of the world. And there's been some measures taken by international financial institutions to ease the fiscal pain for African countries, but these are short, very short-term measures. And yet the, the road to recovery is a long one. So we are uh, saying that um, more measures have to be put in place. Uh, and lending uh, conditions have to be eased for, for the continent. Uh, the debt crisis is making a comeback. Africa borrows at, a, at the highest interest rate compared to the rest of the world because it suffers this sort of pandemic of, uh, of, of a negative uh, rating um, because of the perceptions of Africa as, as high risk, which isn't always true and nor is it fair. Uh, so there is a lot of work to do there also on the Africa side to really change the narrative and bring evidence and facts to bear on the rating agencies which consistently uh, rate uh, Africa unfavorably. How then can the AEC measure progress on this year's edition so that we're not just talking you know, and you know, the actions that follow all of this talk, how can we make sure we're not back to discussing the same challenges next year? Of course, we're going to keep talking about these challenges for a while because they don't disappear overnight. You know, a lot of the things that we've put on the table here will take years to, um, to resolve. So it's going to be an ongoing uh, um, work, you know, in progress. Uh, I think we will be fooling ourselves if we think, you know, by the time next year when we have another AEC that some of these problems would have disappeared. I think there will be some improvement. We, we hope that um, people go away from this conference believing that it's possible to have change. Um, at least that we can get on the path to transformation. We're not going to achieve it all overnight. But I think one other thing that was registered here is we don't have a lot of time. There's, need, there's some urgency to some of the calls to action that we're making here. And we need to put accelerators in place. Africa really needs to get on the speed lane uh, because the young people aren't sitting and waiting. You know, they are frustrated. They, you know, they, they are impatient, and, and, and rightly so. Uh, so it, it's important for governments to register the fact that there's no time to waste and we, we need to approach some of these issues urgently and, and also to introduce tools that help us accelerate uh, progress. Ms. Ahuna, thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for having me.
And this is where we end the program today. Thank you for joining us. Remember, you can catch up on all our other episodes on youtube.com forward slash channels web. I'm Tenyo Lash Bye for now. Thank you.